Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, really pleased to have so many of you joining this Zoom uh, uh, presentation this morning. It's, um, it's a project that has basically taken about five and a half months to do the in-depth research. And um, uh, I'd like to do a special thanks to this list of people here. Um, they had provided some very important information, some critical direction, uh, references, both in terms of uh, other people to speak to, as well as where I could find other resources. Uh, many of these uh, people on this list are actually former Chinese school classmates when I went to Chinese school, as well as other Chinese school students who went to uh, Chinese school at other uh, places than where, where I attended. And many of them had personal material that they had collected from their families as keepsake that probably can't find anywhere else. So I felt very fortunate to be able to have that material in order to put that along with personal stories and recollections into this incredible fact-finding mission. So um, I wanted to highlight a couple people that uh, Mei Jean Chan and uh, Devin Chen Lee, who directed me towards um, Reverend Fung or Carl Fung's book, the Pilgrim, uh, the Dragon Pilgrims, which is a uh, accounts for the history of the Chinese Church in San Diego, which also overlaps with the Chinese school. So it was a critical resource, and um, uh, the one of the other uh, books uh, written by historian Murray Lee, and that book was referred to me through Sally Wong Avery, and that is a book. If you haven't seen either of these two books, you should look into. But uh, but the book by Murray Lee is called In Search of Gold Mountain, okay? It's the history of Chinese history of San Diego. So anyway, those are incredible resources as well as a personal uh, keepsakes that allowed me to put this together. So thank you very much to all of you. Next slide, please. This presentation is uh, called Retracing the History of Chinese Schools in San Diego. And the interesting, one of the interesting things about it is that um, when I was growing up and I went to Chinese school in Chinatown and the, the old mission church, um, I, I went every day uh, for five days a week for six years straight and there were no summer breaks. So that, that was a long time. Considering that at the time that uh, I went, it, I was age six to 12. So those six years during my time at Chinese school was half of my life. So it seemed like a huge, huge, um, uh, time span. But in doing this research, I was able to gain a more interesting perspective because in this 150 years or so history of Chinese schools, my time in Chinese school accounts for probably less than 2% of the history. So that's how uh, expansive this is. Next slide, please. Retracing the history of Chinese schools in San Diego. I'm gonna take you through this timeline today with key marking points. The first one starting in 1870 uh, and uh, going all the way to the present. And uh, um, I will uh, uh, make a highlight and remind you of some of the markers as we go through this presentation. Next slide. One of the ironies about the history so-called of uh, Chinese schools in San Diego is that the first Chinese language schools actually were not in Chinese, they were in English. And that's how it all really started. In 1870, the first Presbyterian church on 8th Street and D Street, which is now Broadway, started the first Chinese mission in San Diego as part of their Sunday school program, which offered English classes for male Chinese immigrants who were pretty much all the Chinese that there were here, I'd say 95% of them, to learn English as well as the Christian teachings uh, two nights a week. Now, to the missionaries, Americanizing the Chinese here was a way of preparing them to take the American culture and also the Christian faith back to China to evangelize, um, you know, all the people in China. But to the Chinese, uh, they were more than willing to become Christianized in order to learn English, which would help them uh, uh, adapt, find jobs, and get around here in um, uh, the United States. On the left, we have a picture of the first Presbyterian church uh, at uh, 8th and Broadway. So next slide. So 
In the beginning at the uh, uh, first mission school, there were only seven students. And as the number grew, they would hire more instructors. So this is very intensive because they didn't understand English. So you almost had to have a one-to-one -one or pretty close to that ratio between teachers and students. So one of their uh, first English teachers happened to be George W. Marston, who is a very wealthy member of the first congregational church and the founder of the Marston department store in San Diego. George Marston would later become a critical long life friend of the financial and financial supporter of the Chinese mission school and the Chinese mission congregational church. We can see the store on the right. And um, uh, George Marston was also a philanthropist. He lived till age 95 and most of his adult life, he was uh, involved with um, the Chinese mission. Next slide. So that was back in uh, uh, the 1870s. 11 years later, in 1881, the American Baptist Church also successfully established a Chinese mission in San Diego. And one of the devoted, very devoted uh, students was a gentleman named Ah Quinn. I don't know if you've heard of him, but everybody should know his name, okay? Uh, he actually grew up in uh, China, and he studied English as a child at the American Missionary School in uh, Canton. And he continued refining his English skills when he came to San Diego, both at the American Baptist Church uh, mission, as well as the First Presbyterian Chinese mission in San Diego. And between these two uh, missions, there were actually about 40 students and the ratio was 25 to 30 teachers. So um, in 1884, Aquin's oldest son was the first Chinese boy born in San Diego and Aquin's uh, children would later become the only children at the early mission school. So on the right, we can see uh, a portrait of his family, which was taken in uh, 1889, but his family had 12 children. So Aquin uh, is famous for being the Chinese railroad labor contractor, as well as a wealthy businessman, and was noted as being the mayor of Chinatown, although he technically wasn't, but he, they had so much respect for him, they called him mayor. Next slide. As the number of Chinese laborers in San Diego grew during the 1880s, so did the number of Chinese missions. Between 1881 and 1883, about 800 Chinese laborers came to San Diego to work on the California Southern Railroad, which was uh, going from National City outward to the east. The Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association also arranged for over 100 Chinese laborers from up north to come down and join the other work crews to construct the Hotel Del Coronado in 1887. And we can see those pictures on the left there. Uh, the Chinese families were also starting to move to San Diego because of the anti-Chinese riots in uh, up north, Washington State, and Northern California. Next slide. But it wasn't until 1885 that Dr. William C. Pond uh, would start the Congregation of Chinese Mission School in San Diego. There was a, a Chinese man named Hong Li who convinced Dr. William C. Pond, the superintendent of Chinese work for the American Missionary Association in San Francisco to start the Chinese school in San Diego, the Chinese Mission School. William Pond rented a house, a very small house on 631 First Avenue, again, happens to be from George Marston. And he started a Chinese mission school and they offered a very aggressive program, free English classes, six nights a week. Uh, and before long, all the Chinese were going there. A word really got around. So uh, his Chinese mission school of the congregation with, of the Congregation Church was the best organized mission with the best mission program in San Diego. And so as his school evolved, Four years later in 1889, Pond purchased a house with his own money, relocated the school to 639 13th Street, where there were as many as 50 students per class studying English and religion for free. In 1900, because of the number of people who were coming from Chinatown, he moved the school to 633 First Avenue on the edge of Chinatown to accommodate convenience for them. Now, the interesting thing about William C. Pond was he came from a missionary family. 
Both he and his father were heavily involved in the Congregational mission, uh, Missionary Program. And he himself had founded more than 49 Chinese missions between 1874 and 1920 and converting an estimated 3,500 Chinese to Christianity, of which a large number of them actually went back to China to spread the word about Christianity. So uh, one of the other interesting things about William Pond was uh, while most of the missionaries were going to foreign countries and learning the language and then converting them, he had a strategy of uh, teaching them English and then having them carry the message back home. So that was a unique strategy at the time. Next slide. So in 1907, Pond moved his mission school uh, uh, down the block, I'd say a few, a few houses or something like that, uh, to 663 first, uh, from 663 First Avenue to 645 First Avenue. And it was a small one-story building with an 18-room dormitory building behind it, which allowed uh, the school to rent out uh, rooms to Chinese bachelors for $5 a month plus $2 a month for utilities. And this building also happened to be owned by George Marston. By 1907, all of the mission schools in San Diego had closed and the Chinese mission school, the Congregational Chinese Mission School, absorbed all of their members. So it was really the place now, but it would still be 18 years before the mission school would offer its first Chinese language program. Next slide. Between 1907 and 1925, the number of Chinese families and American-born Chinese grew immensely. Young Chinese men who wanted to find a Chinese wife had to go to Los Angeles, San Francisco, or even to China. And also Chinese men who were born here in America were also going back to China to get married, to bring back their Chinese wives. So there was a, a incredible need uh, for foreign brides to come to the mission and uh, participate in activities that would help them uh, learn the English language as well as adjust to the American way of life. And we see on the left is uh, the front entryway to the Chinese mission school. And um, the managing uh, director there at the time was a woman named Margaret Fanton, and that's her assistant, Agnes Lee, along with some of the, the uh, kids that were attending there. Next slide. So finally, in 1925, okay, you got to remember, this journey started in 1870. This is 1925 now. Reverend C.C. C. Hung would start the mission's first Chinese language class. Next slide. Reverend C.C. C. Hung was not only the mission's first pastor, he was also the mission's first Chinese pastor. That meant a lot, because in 1925, as the congregation grew, the members really felt they needed a Chinese pastor. So Reverend Ching Chong Hung was born in China. He came to San Diego through Hawaii as a part-time pastor while he was attending San Diego State College. And uh, he was able to deliver both the sermons uh, as, in both Chinese and English. Reverend Hung started an English night class on the weeknights and organized the first Chinese language class for children who were born here. His first Chinese class started with 30 students and met Monday through Saturday, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Next slide. But almost as quickly as he got his classes started, two years later in July of 1927, the mission school was forced to move all of its uh, church services and its classes to the CCBA building, that's the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association in Chinatown. The mission school had become so dilapidated, the building, it was raining, when it rained, it leaked and uh, floors were creaking, plumbing was going bad. So the school turned to the Chinese uh, Consolidated Benevolent Association as a temporary home. And while the old building was being torn down and a new mission was being built, the Chinese classes were held downstairs at the, at the building. George Marston was then persuaded to donate the land that the old mission facility had occupied for the site of the new mission. And in November of that year, uh, the new facility was completed, dedicated, and launched. Uh, the name of the, um, uh, of the school, Mission School, was then changed to Chinese Mission. 
And then in Chinese, when they translated it, uh, it became San Diego Chinese Congregational Church. If you ever see a picture of the front of facade of the of the mission church at that time, you'll notice it says in English uh, on the top, and then the translation is, um, you know, for a sign, it probably had three dozen characters. So it was a complicated translation um, objective. So on the left, we have a picture of the CCA building, uh, circa 1920s on uh, Chinese national uh, National Day celebration, which is the Ind Independence Day, and you can see it in its full fanfare with banners and lanterns and so forth. And on the right is a very interesting picture. The photographer was instructed to take a beauty shot, the, the most critical shot of the new uh, mission uh, building. And you notice he took this picture of the side of the building, not the front of the building. He cropped off half of the front. And the reason why was they were so proud of the fact that it had a two-story dormitory building attached to the sanctuary. So uh, we'll go to the next slide. So after C.C. Hung left in 1928, the Chinese mission would go through four ministers and four long years without Chinese language program. Next slide. By now, in the 1930s, the immigration laws were revised to allow some wives of, or some more wives of uh, Chinese citizens to come to the United States. It basically allowed uh, the wives who were married to U.S. citizens prior to um, 1924 to be able to come because the Exclusion Act had basically shut the door and said nobody could come in. So they made that allowance for the citizens. So by 1933, the city's Chinese population uh, was estimated at 400, and most of them had some involvement with the Chinese mission. Now, you look at the number 400 and you say, but what about all those people that came here to work? Well, they came here to work, and their families came as well, some of them who had families, but um, after the work was over, they moved on to other places, you know, to seek work. So the number had dropped back down to 400. The Chinese mission became a place where young people could get acquainted. More marriages were taking place between California-born Chinese Americans. And by now, the Chinese men who were arriving uh, in California were planning to stay. They um, you know, were no longer just going to get an education or earn some money and then head home. So you can see in the picture on the right that uh, you know, family and children started to increase uh, a lot. Next slide. Now, in 1933, uh, Robert Lee started Mandarin language class at the mission. Next slide. And although most of the members of the congregation were Cantonese speakers, they still welcomed Reverend Lee's Mandarin class because having class was better than not having class. They were also worried about their children, American-born children, losing their, um, their cultural and heritage um, uh, and, uh, and their, la their language uh, appreciation. So prior to joining the mission school, Reverend Robert Lee was secretary of the YMCA in Shanghai. And when he came, he served as a part-time pastor and also was uh, uh, attending San Diego State College. And the reason why that so many of them seem to be coming here and doing a part-time thing is that, um, you know, uh, the, the mission couldn't afford to pay people a whole lot of money. So they had to get people who were qualified and who could also be willing to make the trek to San Diego because they also had, you know, the uh, priority of attending college here. So because he only spoke Mandarin in Shanghai, he did what he could do best. He started the Mandarin class, but he was only here for a short period of time. And after uh, receiving his degree, he went back to Shanghai and resumed his job as the secretary of the YMCA. And then, just like before, the Chinese schools would start up. And then when the, when the minister left, it would go dark again. In this case, the Chinese mission would go without Chinese language instruction again from 1934 to 1936. Next slide. So in 1937, Reverend K. Tin Wong would partner with the CCBA to form the first Chinese language school in San Diego. So that's a very critical marker point on our timeline there is 1937. Next slide. 
When Reverend K.T. Wong and his wife came to the Congregational Chinese Mission with experience of teaching Chinese language in Tucson and San Francisco, so they were very confident, they knew how to put a program together, and, uh, and they felt they could really uh, put together a substantial Chinese school uh, here at the mission. But at the same time, the church could not finance the whole thing. So he wrote to the directors of the Chinese Benevolent Association to seek financial support. And when he got an enthusiastic response, he proceeded to form the Chenghua School, which is the first official Chinese school in San Diego. In March of 1937, Reverend Wang started, uh, started the school with 20 students, which uh, was uh, uh, great. And it also uh, made the Chinese parents very happy because you know, it addressed their concerns about you know, keeping their children um, uh, connected with their language and culture. The classes were held on the ground floor of the CCA building at 426 Third Street in the heart of Chinatown. Now, one of the interesting things about Reverend Wong was that when he, when he and his wife joined the church, they actually were living in the dormitory, you know, as a free place to live. And uh, the Congregational Conference of Southern California only contributed $360 a year towards his salary. And so the CCBA paid him $500 a year for teaching the Chinese school six days a week. And he also taught at the Adult Education Extension Program at San Diego Unified School District, and he was also the church janitor. So he was a hardworking guy, and he was very committed to the welfare and well-being of the upcoming generation of Chinese. He often spoke at the youth conferences, the national youth conferences uh, for um, uh, Chinese youth. Next slide. So the Chenghua School uh, uh, started in 1937. We have a group photo in front of the building. And um, the Chenghua School, when it formally opened, okay, in August, it started, it, it was formed in March, but it, it formally opened in August of 37 with an enrollment of 60, including one European American student. And by the following year, it had increased to 80. Now, this wasn't just a Chinese class anymore. This was a school because they had a principal, they had a vice principal, they had a board of directors, they had a chairperson from both uh, the church as well as uh, the CCBA, and Kei Ten Wang and his wife Edith, along with two other uh, qualified teachers, did all the teaching. And since the Chinese in San Diego were predominantly from southern China, the Guangdong province, that the school taught Cantonese primarily, but for advanced students, they would begin to offer some Mandarin. Next slide. And it was also uh, not just an introductory program to learn you know, some basic words. They actually had a cohesive uh, program. They taught uh, translation, they taught writing, they taught, taught composition, which is uh, leading into journalism. They taught history, they taught geography. Uh, KT Wong would teach the older kids uh, up to age 20 and his wife taught the younger ones which were um, uh, a minimum age of seven years old. And they basically had a blackboard in the middle of the, uh, uh, of the uh, downstairs um, uh, area. And uh, they just split the class and, um, and, uh, and made it work. Uh, classes met two hours a day, 5 p.m. on weekdays and also 10 a.m. on Saturdays. So uh, it was also a six, um, a six day a week program, but a very, uh, a comprehensive program. Now, one of the amazing things about this school was not only was it really well organized, but it was also financed 100% by Chinese businesses and individuals through the CCBA. So that meant zero tuition. Next slide. The Chenghua School was a big success and it went on for almost 10 years, just shy of 10 years. And over that time, um, you know, uh, there was a lot of um, editorial coverage, and this is just happens to be one of them. Headline is, it's China in America right here in San Diego. And that's KT Wong teaching geography to some of the students. And uh, the school was the first uh, Chinese school in San Diego, but it also inspired and motivated an, an entire generation because it 
continued in operation for nine straight years and it empowered them with the understanding of uh, their language and culture and heritage. The upper photo, uh, the, the students in there are Alan Quinn, Jimmy Hom, Marble Lowe, and Rose Hom. So next slide. The spirit was really high there, okay? It was a really well thought out program. And the uh, principal, Tom Soon Kui, actually wrote a school anthem, which reflected, which reflected the high spirit there. And um, it promoted the, the beauty of the country land as well as the, um, the uh, merits of the school. And the words basically go, I love beautiful China, a glorious and heavenly country. Of 5,000 years of ancient history, our culture grows like a long rainbow. The foundation of people lies in children. Let us study the language. Let us brighten the light of our culture. Chenghua School has a great system. We are taught patiently in different subjects. All our young people should work hard to strengthen our body and our mind, learning by our teachers step by step. Let's grow both in morality and knowledge let us brighten the light of our culture. Next slide. So after the December 7th, 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor, all the men in the United, able-bodied men in the United States were required to take a physical and serve in the military to defend the country. Uh, everyone between 18, 16, 18 and 64 had to participate in that, in that uh, campaign. And some of the Chinese school uh, students volunteered to join the Army Air Corps together. And we see some of them, uh, Norman Leong, Jennings Hom, Jimmy Hom, Carl Cooey, and uh, his brother Earl Cooey. And by December 13, 1943, President Franklin Roosevelt signed a law repealing the Chinese Exclusion Act, finally allowing uh, an immigration quota of 105 Chinese a year, and also granted immigrants naturalization rights for the first time. And ironically, on September 13, 1945, K.T. Wong was naturalized, was naturalized and became an American citizen. Next slide. And again, as we say, and we look back at that timeline, um, when K.T. Wong and his wife left the church in 1946, the Chenghua school would close. And um, it was very sad because um, the school really uh, touched the Chinese community. Next slide. And it wouldn't be until 1959 that the Chinese community church and the CCBA would revive the Chenghua school. Next slide. So last time the Chenghua School was held away from the, the mission, it was down in Chinatown at the CCBA building. But this time around, when it was revived, it was opened and it was held at the Chinese Community Church on First Avenue. Now, the, the Chinese uh, mission, Congregational Mission, changed its name um, in 1950 to the Chinese Community Church. So technically, it was the Chinese Community Church that revived the Chenghua School. So at this time, to give you a, a picture of what was going on, by the 1950s, the size of the congregation was flourishing thanks to the War Brides Act of 1945. Um, besides church services and English and Chinese, uh, in English and Chinese and the, and the Sunday school classes for children, the Chinese Community Church also sponsored Ladies Guild, Men's Club, Teenagers Club, picnics, youth outings, uh, vacation Bible school during the summers and the Christmas night program. So all of this, and then on top of that, in 1959, they put, uh, they revived the Chinese uh, uh, Chenghua school. And one of the uh, gentlemen, Mr. Harry Tom, was the president and treasurer. And he went out and he actually went, uh, recruited all the Chinese born children in San Diego to attend the Chinese school. And uh, that's the reason why uh, so many of the kids at that time came from all over the city. The school was open to children from age six and up, and it was open Monday through Friday, 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. 
students sang the Republic of China national anthem every day before class. Tuition now was no longer free, it was $12. And as I mentioned, uh, students, they walked, they took the bus, they carpooled uh, to get there. Their parents just made sure that they got there. It was, it was an important thing to do. Next slide. So the classes for the older students were held in the sanctuary in the main uh, building, uh, portion of the church. And uh, the younger students were taught in separate um, classrooms in the dormitory building, basically the Sunday, the Sunday school classes. Um, so uh, here is a list of some of the students that attended back then. Uh, Stephen Tom, Richard Hom. Uh, Stephen Tom was actually Harry Tom's son. And... Um, uh, Richard Hom, Betty Hom, Omar Hom, they were, uh, their parents uh, ran, were partners in Pullman Cafeteria. Amy Lee, her father was a college professor at, um, at uh, San Diego State. Sue Lowe and, uh, and uh, her brother down below, uh, uh, Ronnie Lowe, their parents ran a grocery store. Anna Tom's parents ran uh, Kwang Chong Laundry. Uh, Jimmy Yi, uh, Gregory Yi, I believe uh, his father was in real estate. And uh, Emma Ham, uh, her family lived in the Binking Tong building uh, dormitories in downtown uh, or in Chinatown. Carolyn He's father was a Chinese herbalist, uh, the, the best Chinese herbalist in San Diego. Judy Dare, Ronald Dare, Richard Dare, uh, they, they, their family ran a restaurant in National City. Pa Jung, uh, Carol Jung, Helen Jung ran a, a grocery store on 29th and Market. Uh, Jimmy Lee, Susie Lee, Jeannie Lee, uh, those are my brothers and sisters. Uh, they were in the older group. Uh, Marie Suhu, uh, parents ran uh, a grocery store in uh, Logan Heights on National Avenue. Evelyn Liu, Jimmy Liu, their parents also ran a grocery store um, uh, in um, uh, Logan Heights. Herbie Lowe's father ran a uh, men's clothing store, the Toggery Shop. Uh, George Joe and Nancy Joe, their, their parents are, uh, and George Joe, the father, uh, was the was the owner of the famous uh, George Joe's Chinese Village on Third and Market Street? Uh, Jerry Hom Jr. and Dexter Hom, uh, their parents were uh, partners in Chinaland Restaurant, which is out in uh, uh, on Midway in Point Loma. Fanton Hom, Jasmine Hom, uh, their parents ran a laundry uh, in the city. Uh, Jean Wong parents ran Frisco Cafe on Fifth and Market. Uh, Shirley Wong parents um, had a small laundry in downtown. Uh, Judy Park, I don't remember exactly what her parents did. Sandra Tom and Randall Tom, I don't know what their, what their father did, but we all knew him as a Chinese magician because he would pull rabbits and uh, doves out of hats at all the, you know, the festive occasions. So anyway, on the younger students, uh, David said, Devon Hom, David said, um, uh, he's one of our uh, commentators uh, today, and um, uh, Devon Hom, Jeffrey Hom, Connie Hom, they were uh, children from the Wuchi Chang family. Uh, Ronnie Lo is the son, uh, is, a, is the younger brother of Sue Lo, they ran a grocery store. Uh, David Dare, younger uh, sibling of um, the Dares up above from National City. Um, let's see, my parents ran a, a laundry, uh, Wang Li Laundry. Um, uh, Sue Hu's ran a grocery store. Uh, Gaiman Tom, parents ran Kwang Chong Laundry. Philip Lu's parents ran Lu's Market in um, Logan Heights. Uh, Teddy Hom and, uh, Teddy Hom and uh, let's see, his father ran uh, 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 several retail businesses in the city. Um, let's see, Victor Hom, uh, parents ran laundry. Donna Young, parents ran a laundry and dry cleaning business. Uh, Sharon Wong, uh, parents ran Frisco Cafe, and um, let's see, we have Jerry Yi, sibling of the above. Johnny and Benji, we just knew their first names. I think they were part Chinese, part Filipino. We ne I never knew their, their last names. So anyway, that gives you an overview of who attended uh, or who was attending at the time. So um, we'll go to the next slide. So that was 1959, okay? They had just done this wonderful thing and launched the Chenghua School of San Diego um, or relaunched it. But the Chenghua School was on the move from 1960 to 1961 because um, at that time, 
a lot of the members of the congregation uh, had moved out to the suburbs and they were um, uh, starting to be more and more. And so the church sold the building on First Avenue and the Chinese school stayed in downtown and it would be relocated several times throughout that period looking for a permanent home until it settled down at the CCBA again on 438 Third Avenue. And um, we see on the left, that is the Chinese Community Church building on First Avenue, that was 1959. And then the next one to the right is 1960 when it moved to the uh, First Congregational Church on Sixth Avenue and A Street. And then it moved again to the First Baptist Church at 10th uh, Avenue and E Street near the public library. And then it moved to the Chenghua School um, uh, in the CCA building. And there were three different uh, teachers during that time period in that short time span, probably about, uh, about a year and a half to two years. It started out with uh, principal and teacher, Miss Liu, and then it became uh, Robert Young and his wife, Cynthia. And then when it came back to Chinatown, it was uh, Mr. Lam, principal and teacher. Next slide. The Chenghua School, 1961. Unlike in the 1920s and 30s when the Chinese classes, Chinese school classes were held on the ground floor, in 1961, the Chenghua School classes were held upstairs. So uh, as I mentioned, the uh, principal and teacher was Mr. Lam. He happened to be a foreign student attending Cal Western University in Point Loma. Classes were held Monday through Friday, 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. with 20 minute recess in between. And um, students came from Point Loma, uh, North Park, Hillcrest, El Cajon Boulevard, Logan Heights, National City, and the State College area. Next slide. This is a page out of uh, the annual uh, Chamber of Commerce New Year's promotion book, okay? This was uh, 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 given to me by Jeffrey Hom and, and the Wuchi Chong family. And um, we see the class picture there. Uh, the principal and teacher was Yvonne Quinn. She was the newly arrived elementary school teacher from Hong Kong, and she happened to be the wife of, or the new wife, of uh, one of Ah Quinn's grandsons, Joseph Quinn, and they, they ran the produce business directly across the street from the CCA building, which is still there today. So if you're ever down in Chinatown, you can see those buildings facing each other. Uh, the Chinese school board included Harry Tom, uh, Miss Harry Jair, uh, Andrew Ham, and David G. And uh, that, uh, uh, the, the previous, um, I guess, uh, uh, not year, but I guess the previous semester in 61, uh, previous to when this picture was taken, the honor student was uh, Marie Suhu, or I guess her Chinese name is uh, Suhu Moheng. So anyway, go to the next slide. This is a closer shot. So those of you who are on this uh, Zoom presentation, who maybe attended Chinese school at that time, or knew somebody who went there or had a sibling who went there, you might recognize uh, someone in this picture. These were uh, the, the school board are the people that I named in the middle. And I'll tell you real quickly who the people are in the shot, starting from left to right uh, from the top row down. It's uh, Lori Ham, Connie Ham, Devin Ham from Wuchi Chong, uh, Mary Ham, and um, Anna Tom and Betty Ham, Mary and Betty from Chinaland, uh, Anna Tom from uh, Kong Chong Laundry, and Anna Wong from Nanking Cafe, Jerry Woon from um, uh, Sun Li Laundry, Omar Ham from uh, Pullman Cafeteria, uh, Carolyn He, the uh, herbalist daughter, and then uh, Jean Wong, Frisco Cafe, uh, Marie Suhu uh, from Grocery Store in um, Logan Heights, uh, My Brothers and Sisters, um, and then uh, there's Jack Woon, Sharon Wong, uh, Jerry Hum Jr. from China Land, Alan Wong from Nankin Cafe. Uh, there's me and there's Henry Suhu again, uh, Jeffrey Hum. Uh, next, Jeffrey Hum. Uh, we don't know who that boy is. We, 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 we uh, passed this picture around to so many people and, uh, and nobody could really recognize him. To the right of him is Teddy Hum, David Said, and Guyman Tom. Next slide. 
This on the left is, a, is a, one of the, the elementary or entry level uh, Chinese school books that, um, that we, uh, we all use, or at least the younger kids started out with. And uh, it was one of those books that had one picture, one word, one picture, one word. And I would say there were probably maybe 12 to 15 words in the whole book, okay? And I would bet dimes to dollars that every one of us, because we memorized it, still know those words today. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, the students shared one large room uh, upstairs at the CCBA, just like they did in the old days downstairs. There's a blackboard dividing in the middle. The younger children, supposedly age seven to 10, at least the younger kids anyway, sat at wooden, little single wooden desks uh, in the front part of the room between the blackboard and the, and the balcony out front. And the older students sat at a huge wood conference room table in the back. And um, uh, Yvonne Quinn, Miss Quinn, would alternate teaching on both sides of the blackboard. She would teach, she'd give us an exercise, hop to the other side, and then she would do the same and do the same for two hours uh, each evening. Uh, the students also, in addition to the everyday uh, class lessons, uh, we would also uh, practice songs and sometimes some dances uh, for group performances at the cultural events, holidays and festivities throughout the, lunar, throughout the, the year, including the Lunar New Year, uh, the Double Ten National Day Festival, Hall of China International uh, Festivals, which I think there were maybe uh, two or three during the year. So it kept us busy, you know, so it was, um, it was a fun program. And, uh, you know, and they had the final exams and uh, they awarded them some uh, uh, school supplies type uh, awards at the time. I never, I never won one. So I just saw other people unwrap them. Next slide. This is a school uh, class picture from 1963. Um, this was also from the annual uh, Chamber of Commerce Lunar New Year promotion uh, book. A uh, principal this time had changed. A principal and teacher had changed to uh, Wilfred Lee, who was um, a graduate student at San Diego State College and his uh, younger sister, who was an undergraduate student there, uh, also teamed up with him to uh, teach all of us kids. And the board of directors, again, Harry Tom as president and treasurer, Andrew Hom was still on there. And this time my father was on there, uh, Ernest Lee. And um, they, I guess they divided the classifications for the awards into different age groups. So this time in 62, it was Constance Hom, Lori Hom, Devin Hom, smart family that probably studied together, uh, Susie uh, Lee, Jean Lee, both my sisters, Jerry Woon, Anna Tom, and Betty Hom. So that's um, uh, the Chinese school of 63. I'll show you a close-up shot um, on the next slide. Now, if you look closely at this picture, okay, um, you'll notice that a lot of the kids are a little bit, or the students are a little bit older. The smallest ones are also a little bit older. That tells you something. Um, that tells you that, that, um, that there aren't as many younger kids starting and the older kids, like my older brother, who's in the middle with the glasses, Jim, uh, he was in the ninth grade at that time. So almost everybody in the middle role, I would say, I would put it this way, 50% of the people in this picture were in junior high school at the time. And that was usually the transition point where homework started getting heavier in American school and um, people would drop out, okay? So uh, this is 1963, probably by late 63, uh, at least a third of the student body was not gonna be there anymore. So uh, uh, enrollment was dropping like crazy. Uh, the students here, Devin Hom, Guyman Tom, Dexter Hom, me, David Said, Jeffrey Hom, Jeannie and Susie, my sisters, Anna Tom, Betty Hom, uh, my brother Jimmy, uh, Jerry Hom Jr., Mary Hom, uh, Jerry Hom, uh, Jacqueline Omar, Teddy, uh, Connie, Lori, and Sylvia Hom. Sylvia is uh, uh, Teddy's younger sister. But um, we'll go to the next slide.
This slide, this slide is a um, newspaper clipping uh, from the San Diego Union Evening Tribune. And uh, it uh, was taken at the Hall of China and uh, at one of the uh, events where the school uh, performed. And um, the newspaper clipping shows uh, Devon Hom, Jeffrey Hom, Guyman Tom, Connie Hom, myself, and then uh, one of the lucky lion dancers, Jack Chan. Uh, they were celebrating uh, the uh, October 10th, 1911 overthrow of the Manchu dynasty, which was um, the beginning or the birth of the Chinese Republic. So a very important day. And that was one of very many articles that were, um, you know, that were featured in the newspaper, uh, highlighting uh, the Chenghua Chinese school. Uh, one last thing is that Wilfred, uh, who was the teacher and principal at that time, uh, just like Yvonne, would teach the older classes uh, in the front of the, or I mean, towards the back of the backboard, uh, the blackboard, and his sister taught the younger kids in the front of the uh, blackboard. Next slide. The Chenghua school, uh, you saw all the kids, okay? Um, I kind of put out uh, some email uh, 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 questions probing to try and collect some thoughts in terms of uh, recollections and what people remembered. And it was kind of interesting to see. Um, Connie Hom said, I'm impressed when I look back now how, all, how we all learn to use brush and ink, which are rarely taught in these days in Chinese classes. Uh, David said, his comment was, I remember Harry Tom sold calligraphy supplies from the trunk of his car. Well, Harry Tom did that, but Harry Tom also recruited everybody. And he also, those who didn't have a ride that were uh, between his house and Chinese school would pick them up and he would uh, uh, bring them to Chinese school and then he would drive them back home. Uh, I have to take my hat off to him. Uh, he did a lot. And um, Sylvia Hom said, I was a little kid and not very studious. I remember a Chinese herb shop or apothecary next door. She's referring to Gim Wing, which was uh, the staple goods store. We used to go there after Chinese school to get ginger pieces for treats and the ginger was really hot. I mean, she, you know, I mean, she, that tells you how, how young some of these uh, uh, students were. In fact, Connie Hom uh, would say, um, uh, that, that she actually started Chinese school when she was four years old. She said, I was four. I started going to Chinese school. Um, I'm sorry. I was four when I started going to Chinese school and Yvonne Quinn became my teacher. She was very kind to us. I remember thinking she was very pretty in her Cheng Sam and that she smiled a lot. So, you know, I mean, although the starting age was supposed to be seven, there were children, members of the family that signed their kids up as young as four. Um, Lori Hom said, many of us came back from recess late and Warford, which she means Wilford, uh, lined us up and smacked the knuckles of all of us. We were just following the older boys like John Lee Wong and Guyman Tom. So I guess um, uh, I was influential there. Um, Connie Hom also said, I, I always thought the CCBA silk costumes were a treat to wear. That was going to the events like the one that you saw on the previous news clipping. And I thought this uh, quote was very insightful as well. And it's another quote from Connie Hom. She said, I felt at a disadvantage because other kids spoke Chinese at home all the time. And our, our parents spoke with us, spoke to us in English, okay? And, um, you know, we didn't know who spoke Chinese at home and not. All we knew is that we were all there. So I imagine it had to be tougher to be walking in there and trying to, you know, absorb all of this without uh, any, um, you know, or as much uh, language uh, being spoken at home. So anyway, on the left is a Chapchi book, which is a traditional uh, brush um, uh, workbook. Uh, which we all had in Chinese school. Next slide. So between 1959 and 1963, that included the beginning of the Chenghua school, the revival of it uh, in 1959 at the mission, 
through the uh, First Congregational Church, the First Baptist Church, back to CCBA. These children here, or students, probably account for, I would say, 90% of the students that went there that uh, during uh, that period. So uh, they started at, at a younger age, stuck to it until probably uh, middle or late junior high school, but that's probably most of the kids that, that, um, that attended there. Next slide. So just as I pointed out to you in um, the second class photo where there was noticeably fewer kids and the kids who were there were noticeably a little bit older, is it the enrollment was shrinking. So due to the shrinking enrollment in 1963, the Chenghua School in Chinatown was closed and relocated to the Chinese Community Church on 47th Street, out towards the suburbs where there were a lot more um, young families starting. And so they would get an influx of, you know, kids that were, you know, just starting elementary school, you know, to join the program and stick with it. So uh, it was a, a critical transition point in the history of Chinese schools. And um, the beginning and end of the first um, uh, Chinese school in Chinatown. So uh, we're gonna uh, stop and see if there are any questions at this point uh, that we can kind of, you know, field. Uh, Mike, to be able to take a few. Okay, um, so I've been reviewing the chat box. There's been a fair amount of activity in the chat box, more comments than questions. Um, so for example, um, we're joined today by Andrea Chen, um, whose grandmother is Minnie Quinn. Um, also by Mary Del Chu, whose, whose father is, the, is Professor Emeritus of History um, from SDSU, Pao Chin Chu. There's also a person named Kao Hui, I think who would like to get in contact with you, John. Um, I will share their email with, with you afterwards. You used to play with them when you were seven or eight. Okay. Um, there are a couple of people who have made comments about be feeling concerned about anti-Chinese sentiment today. Um, Mary Del Chu, Ivy Maldonado, and Paula Carmack. Um, okay. Finally, the last set of comments. Um, so me, Dr. Coker, um, who, who teaches at, at SDSU, he mentions that this is a very fascinating subject and topic, um, that it's documentary worthy. Um, there yeah. are also a couple of comments that are just, people feel really, um, I don't know if the word is probably, people want to commend you on the work, the research and the work that you've done. Um, there have been multiple comments about how you're doing a great job with the presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go on, please. Okay, thank you. Let's move ahead to the next slide. Okay, so that was that was um, when the Chenghua School, a Chenghua, by the way, uh, was spelled C H U N G, and it's W A H, as in this slide here. Okay, uh, in the next uh, later on, the spelling uh, will change with uh, with uh, with a new name to the school. So, but anyway, when when the Chenghua School left uh, Chinatown, okay and uh, was relocated at the Chinese Community Church. Uh, it was also a time when Reverend Zhao uh, had, um, uh, was leaving the church and Reverend Joseph Ma from San Francisco would join the church, okay? And Reverend Ma came from San Francisco. He was born in, uh, in uh, Guangdong, China. And uh, uh, he also studied um, a theology at the at, uh, what is it, uh, Lingnam University there, the, what, the major university in, uh, in Guangdong. And um, uh, he had a wonderful uh, grasp of the Chinese language and he really prided himself in that. So when he joined the church and uh, there was an opportunity to be able to uh, carry the torch of Chinese school uh, in San Diego, uh, he embraced it and continued the Chenghua School uh, from 1964 to 1969. Next slide. 
So in February of 1964, uh, with the continued financial support of CCBA, even though it was no longer being held in the building, Reverend Ma and his wife Virginia began teaching Chinese school at the church. But however, classes at the church would be cut back to only one day a week. It was on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. for children to learn Cantonese. And by 1966, the enrollment had reached, had worked itself back up to 34. My guess is that it was a lot more younger kids coming in, you know, another generation of kids. I know personally that my younger brother, uh, June and Willie both uh, uh, started Chinese school at the end of 63 at, in Chinatown and then it closed. And then my father would drive them to the church uh, on Saturdays because it was one day a week, it was doable. He couldn't do it if it was every day, but they did go there for about a year or a year and a half um, uh, starting in uh, 1964. So, um, so again, the classes were, re the program was reduced to a one day a week versus the, the five day a week. And uh, Reverend Ma also taught adult conversation classes only, uh, conversation only for adults on Tuesday nights, 7.30 to 9 p.m. But, you know, those um, five years, 64 to 69, went pretty fast. So in 69, before leaving uh, for a new pastorship at the First Methodist Church in, La in Los Angeles, Chinatown, Reverend Ma asked Dr. Irene Chang to consider starting a Chinese school program um, at the church because it was very important, okay? So um, the picture on the bottom right is a picture of the Chinese community church. Uh, it was built in beautiful stucco bricks and, uh, and redwood at the time. Uh, it was, at the time, it was considered very uh, modern and uh, uh, contemporary. So this picture was, uh, came from the Chinese Community Church Centennial book cover. So next slide. So in 1970, Dr. Irene Chung thought about what Reverend Ma had uh, told her, and she stepped forward and founded the Chung Hua HWA School of San Diego Incorporated at the Chinese Community Church. Next slide. So we see her there on the left and, you know, she is a, you know, um, one of the, one of the um, uh, best uh, trained educators that you'll ever find for any kind of school, whether it be Chinese or, um, uh, English, American schools, okay, and we'll get into that. But Dr. Irene Chung served as a school's administrator while she was a full-time professor at the University of California, San Diego. So in 1970, she revitalized and expanded the church's language school to include both Cantonese and Mandarin instruction. And she was able to do that only because she had the help of three principal teachers, uh, Miss Kitty Tao, Miss Ming S. Lin, um, uh, Chun C. Lin, and a handful of other, you know, uh, qualified uh, uh, language assistants. So, because Dr. Irene Chung, uh, you know, did not actually teach there, okay, so she had to have a great, uh, you know, a great staff to, to carry on the you know, the actual day-to-day. Uh, -day. In 1971, what she did was she registered the school with the Department of Education in San Diego at Chenghua School, um, uh, at, I'm sorry, as Chenghua School of San Diego uh, Incorporated, and it was incorporated as a nonprofit organization separate from the church, uh, largely for tax reasons, uh, to make the money go further, uh, even though the classes would be conducted at the church. Uh, the school uh, began with 43 students in 1970 and flourished to 93 students in 1977. And in the mid-1980s, the school, uh, Chenghua School, offered Mandarin and, and Cantonese classes for beginner, beginning, intermediate, and advanced students. So it, it was, uh, you know, uh, a lot more comprehensive than the school that I went to. Next slide. Now, some people would ask, you know, who, who is Dr. Irene Chung? 
Okay, Dr. Irene Chung was born in Hong Kong in 1904 to a Eurasian tycoon, uh, Swedish tycoon, Sir Robert Hung, Robert Ho Tung and his wife, Lady Clara Ho Tung. Uh, Sir Robert Ho Tung was actually uh, knighted twice by the Queen of England. So we're talking about a very um, well, well respected uh, family. She received a BA in Hong Kong in 1925, an MA from Columbia in 1929, and her PhD from London University in 1936. And then uh, Dr. Chung became professor at Lingnam University in Guangzhou and a staff member of the Ministry of Education in Nanjing before returning to Hong Kong, where she became the first senior education officer in 1948. And she was appointed an officer of the order of the British Empire by, by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II in 1961. So she had incredible um, uh, experience in terms of understanding teaching and, uh, and, uh, and how to really make it count. Uh, she spent many years as a lecturer on the Chinese cultural life, on, as a lecturer on Chinese cultural life at the University of California, San Diego, and also in community colleges, elementary schools, secondary schools, and was a speaker for many service clubs in San Diego prior to founding, uh, and also during, uh, you know, her tenure at uh, Chenghua School of San Diego. Next slide. Oh. I'm gonna just jump back and throw in one more factoid that someone shared with me the other day. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, uh, uh, the Stanley Ho family um, in Hong Kong. Stanley Ho was, uh, was a, a gentleman who actually created uh, Macau as the, the, uh, uh, the casino capital of, uh, of Asia. And, um, so uh, uh, they are related uh, to, to the family as well. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in. So Dr. Chung set up the school to cultivate uh, a child's complete personality by teaching Chinese and culture, okay? That comes from her long experience of uh, many years of uh, teaching, uh, going to school, some of the finest schools, as well as teaching and, um, and uh, running um, uh, uh, schools of all different levels uh, in China. So her curriculum included conversation, calligraphy, reading, history, geography, music, art, and drama. There were seven different levels, class levels, uh, three in Mandarin, three in Cantonese, and one oral uh, Mandarin for adults. Students only met on Tuesdays, again, one day a week, four to six, and then, I'm sorry, two days a week, one day a week on Tuesdays, and uh, on weekdays, and then also Saturday from 9 a.m. to 12:30 uh, p.m. So it was a. It went from uh, five days a week in Chinatown and the and the um, uh, the Chinese Community Church in Chinatown to uh, one day a week with Reverend Ma, back to two days a week here with uh, Dr. Irene Chung, and um, uh, the adults. They also had uh, they also had an adult class on Saturdays. Now, interesting thing is that the school program also went from um, being tuition free when it was uh, founded in um, uh, 1937. And then it went to uh, $12 a month uh, when I was going. And now uh, with the new program here at the Chenghua School of San Diego Incorporated, it's $45 a month. But that's, four, I mean, $45 tuition for a three-month period. So it went from $12 to $15, okay? So um, $45 tuition per three-month period. And I assumed that the school went all year round. I didn't attend here, so I don't know if they took summer break or not. But anyway, regardless, the $45 uh, for the three-month term was nowhere near the cost of um, the actual cost of running the school. So Dr. Chung with her um, passion and her commitment um, took it upon herself to seek support from family and friends in Hong Kong to keep the school going from 1970 to 1993, 23 years. 
So on the left, we have a photo from the fourth anniversary of the Chenghua Chinese School in San Diego. Um, we can see in the middle, I don't know if you can see him, there's a gentleman with the glasses. His name is Victor O. Chan. And um, uh, so he was the principal at that time in 1974. And the middle photo is a picture of Dr. Irene Cheng teaching sentence construction to Denise Su uh, at the church. And to the right is um, Chak Ho and Lai, Lai Ki. Uh, the two little boys uh, with their Cantonese instructor, uh, Donna Lee, okay, and that was also 1974. These pictures were all, um, you know, uh, made available through uh, a book that David said, uh, shared with me, and it was the 10th anniversary celebration booklet for the Chinese school of, the Chenghua School of San Diego, Chenghua, C-H-U-N-G-H-W-A, uh, Chenghua, School uh, of San Diego Incorporated. Next slide. So just like the, the Chenghua School in uh, Chinatown, the Chenghua School of San Diego at the church also had their uh, school song. But there's a noticeable difference here. Uh, uh, the one uh, previously uh, sang about the, the beauty of the homeland but it also did a lot of sell on the merits of the school and the quality of the school. This song, uh, you know, uh, largely because of Dr. Irene Chung, is purely about the passion, you know, passion for the homeland, the beauty and, and uh, you know, everything that we should remember and appreciate. So um, this song, I was going to ask, I was going to take a break. Does anyone who went to uh, the Tsinghua School of San Diego um, uh, know the song uh, that might be on, on the Zoom call that might uh, want to sing it for us? Feel free to uh, unmute yourselves. Yeah. Okay, I will just take you through the lyrics then. Okay, so the lyrics, the lyrics go, riding on the long, why, excuse me, riding on the long winds flying higher and higher we reach the top of Kunlun Mountains. We turn our heads and see in the east the Great Wall crawling along like a dragon. The five famous mountains standing like screens. Huang Ho is yellow. Yangtze Qiang is long. The Pearl River is rich and fertile. Such great, good rivers and mountains, beautiful and majestic, are our land, are our native land. So it was just really you know, uh, you know, passing on the, you know, the celebration of the homeland uh, with this song. Next slide. So in 1984, Sally Wong, uh, who was a very well-respected member of the Chinese community, uh, was named principal of the Chenghua School of San Diego. Uh, on the left, we have a little, uh, um, uh, uh, clipping, it's, it's the announcement of her um, uh, appointment to uh, being principal. So who is Sally Wong? Sally Wong was ideal for the position because she always had a passion for Chinese language. She was born in Hong Kong, grew up in North Borneo, earned her college and law degree in the United States, and was fluent in Mandarin, Cantonese, Hakka, and English. She was also very well respected uh, uh, in the community, and uh, she was a director of the Chinese Social Center, and she was also a mother of a young daughter. And we'll find out that Sally will play a very important role in the development of um, the Chinese school in San Diego. Next slide. The Chenghua School was, was as I mentioned, uh, according to Dr. Irene Chung, you know, it was about teaching the language. It was about teaching the culture. Her curriculum included that in both Mandarin and Cantonese, but it was also important to include the culture part, which was music, drama, dance. Um, so here we see three, we see um, some uh, photos of, uh, of some of, um, of that program there. The Chenghua Chinese School of San Diego did a lot more than that. 
they raised awareness of the local Chinese community by producing uh, a television program, International Hour, for Channel 8 TV in San Diego. Um, I believe it was it was a, a series where they they you know uh, uh, covered uh, Chinese uh, culture, and uh, they also uh, throughout the years staged lion dances, and um, they would lend Chinese artifacts to uh, uh, different companies that would be of interest. And one of them was the Broadway department store in Fashion Valley. The school also provided information on Chinese culture. Uh, for uh, stage productions when, when they were asked uh, whether they were Chinese productions or just, um, you know, other movie productions. Um, they would also do it for the programs, the stage programs that uh, went along with the Chinese uh, uh, Chinatown uh, uh, beauty pageant during the Lunar New Year. And, you know, from 1970 to 1993, the Chenghua Chinese school of San Diego was the premier Chinese school and, uh, and it would change the lives of many of the American born um, children, probably two generations. But going back to these pictures on the left, okay, we see uh, Arlene Tui standing on the left, okay? And uh, stand, uh, seated on the bottom left is uh, Artie Ham and uh, the other two uh, girls, uh, ribbon dancers, are the sisters, siblings of uh, Arlene uh, Tui, and their names are Gloria and Denise Tui. So um, uh, from what I've read is that uh, their ribbon dance was, um, you know, was incredible to watch, you know. Um, to the right, we see uh, uh, a lion dance and the gentleman in there is named Matt Tom. Um, and, the group of singers at the top, we were not able to, you know, track down uh, the names of them, but, you know, but, but, you know, they were part of the, the drama, art, and performance program uh, at the, at the school. Um, these, these pictures were also uh, from the Chinese Community Church Centennial book, as well as the Chenghua School 10th Anniversary book. Next slide. So at this time, or for a long time, the Chinese, the Chenghua School of San Diego was the premier school, Chinese school in San Diego, okay, it being held at the Chinese Community Church. But between 1979 and 1988, uh, when there was an influx of um, more Chinese families coming to the United States, several other Chinese schools uh, began to open uh, between the North County and the South Bay because, you know, uh, it was probably too far for them to come uh, to one location. And on the other hand, you know, uh, the Chenghua School of San Diego at the church was probably not big enough to accommodate a whole lot more than what they were doing. So they had their plates pretty full. Next slide. So, that being said, in 1993, okay, um, Dr. Irene Chung gave it some very careful consideration, you know. Uh, her passion says keep going, but, you know, uh, you know, her body is telling her, you know, uh, maybe it's time to close the school. So in 1993, she closed the Chenghua School of San Diego because of uh, not only diminishing funding, but also at that time, she was, I believe she was 88 years old. And there were also some members of the school administration that were also getting up in age and were uh, uh, either thinking about retiring or had already started retiring. So timing wise, 1993 seemed like it was, uh, you know, the time to, um, have to um, say goodbye. Next slide. But as I introduced you earlier, Sally Wong, the, uh, the principal at the school, and Sally Wong uh, would reopen the school later that year, but under a different name. It went from the Chenghua School in Sa of San Diego to the Chinese School of San Diego. 
and she did it with her personal funding. Okay, so um, uh, she picked up the torch and carried on. Next slide. From 1993 to 2008, the Chinese School of San Diego grew by leaps and bounds under the, the leadership of Sally Wong, okay? Sally Wong's vision was to make the, the school, I'm sorry, Sally Wong's vision was to make the school's Chinese language and culture program not only available to uh, American-born Chinese uh, children, she also wanted to make it available to students of all ethnicities. So that was, that was a, uh, a big step. And then the second thing that she wanted to do was to make the Chinese School of San Diego the only fully accredited Chinese language program in the county. The Chinese School of San Diego was registered with the San Diego Unified School District and the Southern California Chinese Council of Schools, and it would become the only Chinese school to receive accreditation with the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. So between 1994 and 2008, the Chinese School of San Diego moved several times from the Chinese Community Church to Coleman College campus, back to the Chinese Community Church, to two different locations on Arrow Drive and constantly looking for more space to expand. In 2008, Sally would finally move the Chinese School of San Diego to its current custom built campus on Ruffin Road and launch their Chinese bilingual preschool. So between 1994 and 2008, the enrollment at the Chinese School of San Diego increased by 265% from 60 to 160 students. So um, we see on the left, uh, Sally's husband, Dennis Avery, uh, conducting the commencement ceremony uh, during one of the years at Coleman College. Um, on the right, we see Sally Wong uh, when she was uh, leading the commencement uh, ceremony um, of the Chinese school when it was at uh, Arrow Drive. Uh, and in between, we see a photograph of um, the student body when the Chinese school had to move back to the Chinese community church temporarily while they were uh, trying to secure other um, suitable space. And that was in the year of 2003. So yeah, there was a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, advancements made, not only by the Chinese School of San Diego, but for the whole um, um, meaning of what it takes to uh, run a, um, uh, a highfalutin uh, Chinese school program with all of the certifications and, and uh, reaching out to not just Chinese uh, community, but anybody who had the passion and interest. Next slide. So in 2005, backtracking just a half a step, part of what made this, uh, help make this all possible was in 2005, Sally's husband, Sally's husband, Dennis Avery, had bought her a building on Ruffin Road. And uh, that allowed her to create the ideal campus which would be completed in 2008. Uh, it would allow her to, to uh, create a program that would uh, accommodate uh, the ideal number of students, okay, uh, where they could control the, um, the number of students so they could uh, make sure that the quality of the program was uh, at its best, uh, both for um, preschool and uh, kindergarten all the way through uh, high school. Next slide. When I, when I interviewed Sally uh, Wong, who's, um, uh, when she got married, her name became Sally Wong Avery, okay? So in interviewing Sally Wong Avery, you know, about uh, her involvement with the, um, Chenghua School of San Diego at the church, and also, um, you know, uh, taking on the um, uh, responsibility of carrying on, you know, the Chenghua School lineage, okay? Um, 
she talked about a number of things, but one of the, one interesting thing that she said was, and I think it's driven by um, by passion, is she said, "My ultimate dream would be to offer my ultimate my ultimate dream would be to offer instruction in all the major Chinese dialects, um, not just Mandarin and Cantonese." The realities are, I don't know if it's possible, but that's where her heart is at. So I thought that was interesting. So today, Chinese School of San Diego's program uh, still includes both Mandarin and Cantonese lang language instruction from K K kindergarten through 12th grade and their bilingual preschool and foreign language credits that can be transferred to San Diego County school districts. It's accredited by the Western Association of, College, uh, of Schools and Colleges and is open to passionate learners of any age and ethnicity, okay? She also told me that they also do get people, you know, who are trying to learn uh, Mandarin and Cantonese for their business as well, or for whether it's travel or whatnot. And, uh, and they will also, you know, uh, uh, put together special programs to help them accommodate their needs. So uh, Chinese School of San Diego's campus, as it was designed, has 14 in indoor classrooms a privately owned gallery of ancient Chinese art so that their students can really uh, uh, appreciate, uh, you know, seeing and uh, being around um, this, um, this art collection. They also learn from the art collection the history of, of um, uh, different periods of uh, Chinese history. Uh, it also has a full commercial kitchen uh, for uh, student meal preparation, uh, primarily for the preschool, but they also use it for cooking classes uh, from time to time. The Chinese School of San Diego uh, these days, uh, during the last year, is fully compliant with the latest uh, state COVID-19 safety guidelines. And, um, you know, we can see the picture on the left. The, the top two rows is the Chinese School of San Diego, just a, a couple of shots. Uh, to give you an idea of what it, what it looks like on the inside. And, um, and these were pre-pandemic, so large groups, close proximity is not an issue. And down below, you can kind of see the Chinese uh, flavor of the preschool. You can see a giant carved, um, it's an ivory ship. You can see the, the music instruments and things like that. So yeah, it's... it's um, um, it was a custom tailored um, uh, plan. Next slide. Since 1993, the Chinese School of San Diego has, has been remained committed to giving the students uh, of all ages and ethnicities in San Diego the best possible Chinese language and culture enrichment program. Their staff uh, uh, are all uh, selected from candidates from Hong Kong, China, and Taiwan. The administrative team is constantly looking for um, the best learning materials from Asia, and they also um, uh, think about and develop proprietary content for their curriculum. So, um, and that includes Chinese history, geography, literature, philosophy, uh, Chinese customs, uh, Chinese art, Chinese music, Chinese uh, Asian fashion, uh, and also a cuisine. So. Um, the school also has streamlined its regular staff of 20 bilingual instructors. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, they've narrowed it down to 10 prolific virtual-minded uh, Zoom instructors. And uh, this is to help keep their students engaged uh, with their studies. You know, uh, some of them have been there might be their first year, some might be in their third year and, uh, and so forth. So they just uh, are doing this to keep them on track while they're not able to necessarily get together. Next slide. So what does the landscape of Chinese schools in San Diego look like today? Okay, uh, when it started out, when we look back at the timeline, uh, the, Chinese school, the Chinese schools anyway, uh, started out, they were in English, okay, for 1870 all the way to um, 1925 was when the first Chinese class was was um, uh, was set up, and um, uh, that was with uh, C Reverend C. C. Hung. 
And then from there, it went to um, uh, 1937 when um, KT Wong uh, teamed up with CCBA and created the, the first Chinese school uh, um, in San Diego, uh, where it was had its own funding and everything else. And then from there, when uh, that was closed and revived uh, in 1959, when uh, the Chinese Community Church and the CCBA uh, revived it and it was held at the church It moved around the city back to CCBA, was shut down, went to the church. Um, so at that time, there was still basically, for the most part, at any given time, one, okay? Um, and um, not until, as I had mentioned, uh, into, uh, I would say it was um, 1979 to 1988, that there started to be a few more opening up because of influx of um, new families coming from uh, not just Southern China, but they were coming from Taiwan, um, Malaysia, they were coming from Singapore, they're coming from uh, different parts of China where Mandarin was a little bit more uh, of the uh, language spoken at home. So, uh, so we get to today, the landscape, and um, although at one time, Chenghua School, W-A-H, and Chenghua School of San Diego, H-W-A, uh, were the only Chinese schools in the city, but today there are more than 20 independent Mandarin Cantonese culture schools throughout San Diego, North County and South Bay. And the number within that number continuing to grow, okay? The schools include a half a dozen, the half a dozen well-established independent Chinese language culture schools. Excuse me, can I get this phone? Hang on one second. Sorry. Okay. So as I was mentioning, the number of schools is still growing. The school, the schools include a half, the half a dozen well-established independent Chinese language culture schools, which include uh, either a preschool or a kindergarten program and extend through um, high school with fully accredited um, uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, but in addition to that, there are also uh, Chinese schools that are preschool only, elementary school only, uh, after school and weekday only. And uh, there are Mandarin uh, programs, or I'm sorry, language programs now, that are also um, offering multiple languages which are Mandarin and English, Mandarin and Spanish, Mandarin and um, uh, Spanish and French, Mandarin, Spanish and Hindi. So that gives you the landscape of what, what um, you know, what is um, evolving out there today. Next slide. So among all the growing number of Chinese language schools in San Diego, Chinese School of San Diego is the only one that offers both Mandarin and Cantonese instruction today. Okay, I think it's, um, you know, uh, a lot of them only offer Mandarin because that's where the direction that things may be going, but Sally is, is, uh, is committed to, you know, uh, uh, offering both. So next slide. So not only is uh, Chinese School of San Diego the only school that offers both Mandarin and Cantonese today, but uh, they're um, also continuing to lead the way with its over 100 years of Chinese school history. And that history goes all the way back to 1885 um, with the uh, Chinese um, uh, mission school. So next slide. This is a glimpse of um, this is a glimpse of the resources that helped me retrace the history of Chinese schools in San Diego. Uh, I know I mentioned some of the names, but this gives you a, a visual 
uh, as to uh, what they are, what they look like. Uh, number one is the uh, 10th anniversary book and a whole collection of uh, Chenghua School uh, of San Diego newsletters uh, that David said had, um, you know, um, uh, 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 shared with me. Uh, that was, you know, uh, really wonderful in terms of being able to um, uh, capture the history of uh, that part of, of, uh, of the, the history timeline. Number two is that um, a book that I received from uh, Henry Suhu and his family, and it's the Chinese Community Church uh, Centennial uh, issue, which um, uh, talks about the 100 years of the Chinese Community Church, and it also had a lot of wonderful information about uh, Chinese school um, during that period, but also how it um, uh, uh, played in terms of the um, the total church program. Uh, number three is the cover of um, In Search of Gold Mountain by Murray Lee. That was uh, referred to me by uh, uh, Sally Wong Avery. It's a, it's a great book on the history, the Chinese history of San Diego. Um, can't say enough about uh, Carl Fung's book, The Dragon uh, Pilgrims. And um, that is, that's a small paperback book, but um, the, uh, the information in it is incredible in terms of not only the Chinese church, um, the history of the Chinese church, but also uh, the history of Chinese school and the importance of Chinese school instruction, as well as um, um, uh, how it, how it uh, changed um, uh, uh, generations of, of uh, Chinese kids. Uh, number six is an interesting book. It's uh, Gospel Pioneering, and uh, that is a book that was written by William C. Pond, and it talks about the, the congregationalism in California uh, and, uh, and covers a lot on the, the Chinese congregationalism in California. As I mentioned, that he had actually started 49 uh, Chinese missions uh, during his period. Number 10 is uh, one of many um, uh, editorial um, uh, pages uh, covering the history of Chinese schools. That one was provided to me by uh, David Said as well. And then there's some online resources, lots of it. The San Diego History Center, which has uh, numerous um, um, uh, volumes uh, about uh, different kinds of history and a lot on the, uh, the San Diego uh, Chinese community history, uh, and also um, the San Diego Chinese Historical Society and Museum, uh, as well as newspaper articles and editorial from the San Diego Union Tribune, the San Diego Reader, and also uh, the South China Morning Post. So, um, yeah, again, I'd like to, you know, thanks for, say thanks to all the people that, that helped uh, me retrace the history. I think I learned a lot, you know. I think that, as I said uh, earlier, that my tenure uh, or period uh, involvement in Chinese school was six years, um, uh, six days a week uh, between, I would say, it was like 19, uh, uh, I think I stopped going in 1963. So it was probably 1957, no, 1959 to 59 to 63. So um, thereabouts. So anyway, um, it's incredible, you know, uh, the time span. And I know that uh, many of you out in the, uh, uh, the audience today uh, lived a different part of it, okay? And, um, and you probably, you definitely know that in detail more than I was able to experience through my research. So at this point, what I'd like to do is uh, turn to uh, opening up uh, questions or any, uh, um, or, 